Hi everybody, and welcome to the Hall of Muttering. More than just a room where a bunch of drunk dwarves tell each other stories all day, the Hall is one of the ancient repositories of knowledge which the Infernal Dwarves founded after the Age of Ruin. So today, with such wisdom in mind, I bring you a battle report between the Vampire Covenant and the Infernal Dwarves. This was my first time playing against this opponent. I've seen him play and I've heard tales of him laying waste to other armies, so I was curious to see how this game would go. My track record against the undead isn't great, so I went into this game with high hopes but low expectations. As always, I want to talk a bit about deployment before we get started. After placing and scattering our terrain randomly, our table had hills, four hills, uh, mostly in the middle of the board. Those two yellow pieces are ruins, and we also had two stone fences. The three markers in the middle of the table represent caches of weapons we're fighting over as our spoils of war secondary objective. I got to pick sides, and I chose the bottom side. The wall near the center of the board looks like an ideal place for my hobgoblins with bows to hide behind, uh, defend. And since my Taruks have Strider Ruins, I wanted to at least have the opportunity to try and make some use out of it. I know that my opponent, being the corrupt abomination of the undead that he is, will probably place the bulk of his army near the center of his deployment zone, and as he would come over the units, I thought I'd have some better opportunities for shooting. If it weren't for the secondary objectives, I would have been happy to sit back and shoot at him all day. But I also knew if I wanted to get those weapon caches back, I'd have to move forward on some pretty stubby little legs. And that meant I deployed on the 12-inch line. Okay, that's deployment, let's get to it. Starting from left to right, my opponent had three vampire knights. Those look like three highborn elves that are never going back home. To the right of the knights are 32 ghouls in line formation, and behind them is a master necromancer of alchemy accompanied by 26 of his best zombie friends. Haunting the ruin are two phantom hosts, and next to them is a big bus of 40 skeletons. And here's the center of my opponent's vampire army. A vampire count wielding True Thirst and leading 14 Barrow Knights who are bearing the standard of Zagvazd. This build has become almost synonymous with a vampire covenant's army, and it scares me. So long as my opponent plays conservatively, there's a reasonably good chance that I can crack this unit, which will win me the game. But if he's aggressive, I'm in trouble. Especially since he has three winged reapers with paired weapons right next to that unit to support him. He also has another two phantom hosts trying to provide some cover from the reapers against missile fire. Obviously, he fears my hobgoblins and their bows. Obviously. And rounding out his right flank are four vampire spawn who will undoubtedly try and sneak behind my lines and make a nuisance of themselves. Starting on my left side, I have Grimbold, my visor battle standard bearer, riding his bull of Shemut and standing on the pillar of triumph. As you know, Grimbold's decorated his pillar with the shields of his fallen enemies, and I told my opponent I was very much looking forward to adding his shield as another defeated enemy to Grimbold's pillar. Next to him is my Kadim Titan. He just wants to give everyone big lava hugs. And ready to support are 20 loyal hobgoblins with spears and shields. Leading the hobgoblin is Genghis Khan, the hobgoblin Khan, and he's riding his wolf, Lucky. I have 30 more hobgoblins. These have bows and shields. Next to them is my overlord general and 20 of his immortal bodyguard, proudly bearing the banner of Shemut, Lord of Justice. Safely behind those two are my two titan mortars. On the far right, making their debut in my army are 10 Taruks. Yes, five of them are proxied as dogs. If you read the forums, everyone says they are terrible and aren't worth taking as anything more than five man scoring darts. But according to my math, these guys should cost around 35 points a model, but they actually only cost 25. That's a 30% discount. I think the reason is, one, not many people have these models, but two, everyone seems to love Taruk Anointed. And who wouldn't? They have really awesome models. Uh, so for now, they're in my roster, and hopefully we'll see what they can do. And my right flank is held securely by a brick of 20 citadel guard with flintlock axes and also bearing the banner of Shemut. Quite often I deploy them wide, but I have a feeling I'm going to need them in a brick to handle those vampire spawn. If they do, 
I might just have to decorate their pillar with a vampire spawn skull. Here's an overall shot of the board. We matched deployment for deployment right up to the end when my opponent dropped everything he had left, giving him plus four on the roll to go first. So while I was sacrificing goats and trying to get my hobgoblins standing in straight lines, the Vampire Covenant began its advance. Vampire Covenant, turn one. On the right-hand side, the Vampire Spawn would creep up the board edge to threaten my Citadel Guard. And in the middle, everything advances straight forward, keeping a nice, neat battle line. It's now painfully obvious my opponent is coming straight at me, and with a pretty substantial movement advantage, the pressure is on. Here's the left side of my opponent's army, and thank goodness it doesn't move very much, with the three vampire knights advancing slightly. The ghoul star is the one unit I absolutely do not want my Kadim Titan coming into contact with. They have a lot of poison attacks, and he does not like poison at all. He kept them behind the hill, and I... I'm extremely happy with that choice. In the magic phase, the Master Necromancer only manages to get one spell off, and that is a Silver Spike shot into my rightmost Titan Mortar. He inflicts two wounds, but I'm okay with that since it's got four more to go. And with the Vampires being done, it's turn one for the Infernal Dwarves, which starts with my Citadel Guard doing a swift reform to face the Vampire Spawn and shuffling the right a little bit to get a better shot at them. In the middle, my Immortals don't want to be double-charged by those Knights and the Winged Reapers, so they back up. The Taruk unit does the same. They could charge across the field, uh, but if they charge and make it, they'll kill some Phantom Hosts and then overrun into the Winged Reapers, but next turn they'll get flank-charged by the Knights and destroyed. Instead, I've angled them so that if those Knights want to bring a Long Bomb charge into the Immortals, the Taruk can act as a support unit next turn. Uh, the back rank of those proxy dogs didn't balance on that ruin very well, but trust me, they're in there. And my left flank moves up. The hills are blocking my opponent's line of sight, which gives me the opportunity to ignore his units for a turn and advance freely. The hobgoblins with bows will hold the wall, while Genghis the hobgoblin chieftain, Grimbold, and the titan all face the center, ready to smash anything that tries to run across the battlefield. The small unit of hobos with spears are getting ready to take on those three vampire knights. They are very brave. I have utter contempt for wizards in general, so I didn't bring any. We went straight to the shooting phase. My first mortar scored a direct hit on those skeletons and killed nine of them, uh, but the second one missed its target completely. If you see a red gem on the table, I use that to denote which unit is suffering the effects of the earthquake shells. The hobgoblins managed to not kill anything at all, and the Citadel Guard on the right inflicted three wounds on the Vampire Spawn, sending one model back to the grave. Not a bad shooting phase. And with that, we move into Vampire Covenant's turn two. Starting on the left side, the Vampire Knights move forward along the table edge, showing their complete and utter disregard for my hobgoblins with spears. Yep, those were highborn elves at one time, all right. It appears not even an age of... Corruption and decay can erase that sense of moral superiority they was so well known for. And on the right-hand side, the vampire spawn try and slip past my citadel guard. Here's a better shot of his battle line of the middle of his army. He's keeping his lines neat. He's got the phantom hosts acting as chaff so I can't charge anything important. And unfortunately, he's doing a pretty darn good job of encircling me from right to left. Here's just a close-up shot of that unit of skeletons picking up the objective marker. Here's an overall shot of the board. It's actually at the end of the Vampire Count's turn two. I apologize if it's a little blurry, but we were playing on a bar level table. So these shots were me literally holding my camera as high as I could and then just pressing the button a bunch of times, hoping something would come out. You can see at the end of the movement phase, he moved one of his other phantom hosts up to chaff up the Kadim Titan, and the ghoul stars moved onto the hill, getting ready for action. In the magic phase, the master necromancer managed to cast another silver spike into my mortner, into my titan mortar, and inflicted one wound. And the vampire general regrew the nine skeletons that I pounded flat into the ground bringing the skeleton unit back up to full strength. Turn two for the Infernal Dwarves, and we start off with the Kadim Titan failing his first frenzy test and having to charge the spirit hosts. Yay, he's up to seven attacks. 
And since Grimbold can see the flank of the zombie bunker where the master necromancer is hiding, he declares a charge. Here's a picture of the Titan making it in with the phantom host since he's excited to give them some lava hugs. And Grimbold, who only needed a seven to reach the zombie bunker, gets ready to introduce himself to a master necromancer. And in the regular movement phase, my hobgoblin brick on the left with spears turns around. I know those vampire knights want to get into my titan mortars. He's tired of me dropping rocks on his head. So they're swinging around wide. The vampire knights can't see the hobgoblins, but they do have to run past them. And if he's willing to give me his flank or his rear, I am more than happy to take it. I don't need them to win combat. I just need them to tie him up. And here's the middle of the army. My Immortals and my Taruk just do not have any good charges. My opponent is playing very cagey with that Phantom Host, and he's doing a great job, unfortunately, of keeping me boxed in. At this point, it has become painfully obvious my opponent is coming to me whether I want him to or not. Instead of some grand plan, my Immortals shift slightly, getting ready to take the charge while the Taruk position themselves to countercharge. And in the bottom left, my Titan Mortar moves over one and a half inches directly away from those Vampire Knights that are coming to eat it. They don't want any part of that. And if moving him and sacrificing a shot will save the other Titan Mortar for one more turn of shooting, I'm all for it. Of course, in the shooting phase, the rightmost Titan Mortar misses and the Hobgoblins guarding the wall, at least they managed to kill a handful of ghouls. And still holding down the right flank is my Citadel Guard. They go wide to shoot at some vampire spawn and hopefully send another one of those models back to the grave. Here's a quick overall of the board before we go into the close combat phase. Something I forgot to mention before, or rather the picture turned out very bad and so I didn't post it. Uh, up in the top left, you'll see Genghis Khan has bravely climbed the hill to face that ghoul star. He is willing to sacrifice his little life in order to give the Kadim Titan time to get into where he needs to be. After the smoke clears, the Citadel Guard put a whopping one wound on the vampire spawn. The Kadim Titan is able to handle the phantom hosts. And Grimbold somehow manages to kill a tough three, no armor, no ward save master necromancer all by himself. Good job, Grimbold. That's actually huge though. My opponent is now left with only two spells on his vampire and Grimbold should be able to handle these zombies on his own. And at the end of Infernal Dwarves turn two, here's a fuzzy shot of the board. Things are about to get real. The Vampire Covenant turn three. Well, if it's good enough for my Kadim Titan, it must be good enough for some vampire spawn. They copy me and fail their frenzy test, so they want a piece of that Citadel Guard action. Over in the middle, the Vampire Covenant General and the Winged Reapers both declare charges into my Immortals. My Immortals are brave, and if they flee, they'll flee off the board, so they'll take it. Now the Vampire Knights need a 10, and the Winged Reapers need an 11. One of them might make it in, which is great, because that'll give my uh, Taruks a chance to counter charge, so I'm okay with this. This looks good to me. And here's little Genghis Khan getting ready to take a charge from some ghouls. Now I see they've got the uh, Titan Mortar Earthquake Shells effect on them, so that's right. I didn't miss, I hit them with a partial. I only killed a handful of models, like two, but if they charge, they'll take dangerous terrain and anything I can do to thin out that unit is better. Here's the vampire spawn, making it in as best they can. Okay, this does not look good to me. I did not expect both units to roll out of the box and cross the entire field into my immortals. This does not look good at all. I am in a lot of serious trouble. Genghis Khan's not in trouble. He's got this. In the regular movement phase, the Vampire Knights decide not to do a long charge and instead just move up and get ready to eat my first Titan Mortar. My opponent's big block of skeletons with spears turn to face the incoming Kadim Titan and guard that little objective token. Give it back, it's mine. And not having a way to really make a nuisance of themselves, the bats and the spirit host just kind of wander forward looking for some place to be. And here's an overall shot of the board. This turn, I am able to completely shut down my opponent's magic phase. Yay me, go dwarves. So we go straight into combat. Grimbold starts making short work of those zombies. Genghis Khan, on the other hand, took no wounds, but he inflicted no wounds on that ghoul horde. Instead, he made a tactical retreat. 
which left the Horde of Ghouls free to turn around and face the Kadim Titan. Ugh, and then it goes from bad to worse. My Immortals start off by failing their fear test. I have two Ultra Killy units to my front, and I am Weapon Skill 2. Well, they should be Weapon Skill 1, but they have the Banner of Shamut, so they are Weapon Skill 2, and that's important. That means the Knights are hitting them on 3s instead of 2s because they have the Undead Banner of Zagvod, I think it is. All It's okay. All I have to do is keep my General alive, and they'll be stubborn. They have Bodyguard. They're great. So... My general bangs his big hammer on his shield and says, Who's ready to face the furnace? And the knight champion steps up. The knight champion does no wounds to my general. My general does no wounds to the champion. Fortunately, the vampire general only kills two dwarves. He rolls fairly poorly. And the dwarves themselves, even with hatred, kill one knight and put one wound on the winged reapers. Unfortunately, I think the Vampire General brought that knight back with his vampiric role, but I hold on bodyguard and I'm staying for a second round. I was sweating that role, but I am in so much trouble, I have no idea what I'm going to do here. And in the right corner, the Citadel Guard promptly fail their fear test too. They are weapon skill too, because they are also carrying the banner of Shemut, but Shemut does smile down upon them and they roll out of the box, killing one vampire spawn at the low, low price of two dead dwarves. I'm so distraught at this point, I completely forget to make my reform roll and bring more dwarves into combat. So we start off with Infernal Dwarves turn three. Genghis Khan fails to rally, and that's how far he got over the table edge, so he runs home for dinner. Here's an overall shot of the board before I made any charges. I had to look at this for a good long time before I could proceed, because I need to get my Kadim Titan into those skeletons. They have an objective marker, and that will swing the game. At this point, I don't even know if I'm going to get an objective. The problem is the ghouls on the hill will charge down into his flank next turn, and with their poison attacks, I think they'll take down the titan in one turn. My titan does not like poison. Even if I were to march the hobgoblins straight forward at max rate, they would not be, they're not close enough to be able to block the ghouls, so he's in trouble. At this point, I came up with my bold plan. I have two Titan Mortars. I'm about to lose them to Vampire Knights, so it's time to make their final shots of the game. If they can hit the ghouls and even inflict one wound, not only will he have to take dangerous terrain checks when he charges the Titan, but he'll also have to reroll sixes to hit. If I can do it in one wound, my Titan should be fine. If I miss, my Titan is dead, and that is probably the game. So with a bold plan in hand, the Titan declares a charge on the skeletons and the Taruk charge into the flank of the winged reapers. Hey, they finally get to use that uh, Strider Ruins rule. Go Taruks. And my hobgoblins make a charge into the rear of those vampire knights. They are plus six combat res going in. If the vampire knights can just not do very well, I should hold them in place and save my Titan mortars for one more turn of shooting. Here's a picture of the Taruks making their charge. Here's the Kadim Titan making his charge. And here's a quick overall of the board. We go to the shooting phase. My first mortar fires, misses, and then misses the partial. My second mortar fires, gets a direct hit, and kills another handful of ghouls. Just to add insult to injury, my hobgoblins with bows also shoot and kill a few more. That unit looks very manageable, and I think my Titan should now be safe next turn. In the combat phase, the Citadel Guard are looking good. They pass their fear test and kill one more vampire spawn. Up top, Grimbold finishes off the last of those pesky zombies and turns to face the center of the board, looking for more action. At the other end of the table, down on the bottom, the Hobgoblins put one wound on the Vampire Knights. I'm very impressed. Unfortunately, the Vampire Knights live up to their name and slaughter one, two, three, five, six, six or seven hobgoblins. 
Overwhelmed by the Vampire Knight's ability to slaughter them like children, the Hobgoblins make a tactical retreat. The Vampire Knights do not fall for the bait and stay where they are, ready to eat my mortars. And the big combat. I'm happy to say this started off with everyone passing their fear check. In the challenge, the knight champion still could not wound my general, while my general still could not put one lousy wound on a champion knight. The Taruk did fairly well, killing one ring winged reaper. My opponent's general rolled like a kitten in a bag and killed one dwarf, while the winged reapers and the knights killed a few more. In the end, it was a push, and we all stick around for yet another round. After combat, here's a look at the board. A final shot of Infernal Dwarves turn three, and we turn it over to the Vampire Counts, turn four. The Vampire Knights start us off with a charge into my mortar. And they make it. I think we know how that's gonna turn out. The Ghouls make their charge into the flank of my Kidim Titan, and I'm still a little nervous about that one. And in the center of the table, my opponent's chaff units kind of wander around looking for a space to haunt and not really knowing what to do with themselves. In the magic phase, my opponent only has two spells. I happily let the first one go through because it really doesn't matter. I save all of my dice for a second spell and I roll a fistful of ones and twos. So he brings back one dead knight. He brings back the one dead reaper. Unfortunately, he also brings back a handful of skeletons and a big handful of ghouls. My Kadim Titan is not happy. He looks down at the skeletons and said, I've already hugged you. Why are you coming back? Close combat phase. The Citadel Guard finally kill the last of those nasty vampire spawn. The mean vampire, knight, the mean vampire knights make short work of the first Titan Mortar and overrun about an inch and a half short of Titan Mortar number two. And in the middle, it's a slaughter, and not for the good guys. It's down to my general and the immortal champion. All the rest of the immortals have been cut down. My general is still in a challenge with that pesky knight champion who he can't seem to kill and who can't seem to even wound him. This is actually probably the best case scenario. It's enough to keep my general stubborn this turn, and next turn, the vampires can only get one combat resolution by killing the immortal uh, battle standard bearer, which should be enough for my general to stand on his own leadership. On the right hand side, the Taruks have done a great job killing off more winged reaper goodness. They took a few casualties in return, but this is their first batch of casualties they've taken. So far, I'm not disappointed. And up top, oh, I love my Kadim. He did great. There are not very many of the ghouls left. He's going through the skeletons with great efficiency, and he took three wounds from the entire process. There's not enough ghouls left to threaten him with poison attacks. He should be able to wrap up both of those units next turn. Which brings us to turn four. We start off with the Citadel Guard charging the Phantom Host. It's time for them to get back in the game. Even though my opponent probably can handle those two units on his own, Grimbold sees the juicy flank of those skeletons and declares a charge there too. But dwarves aren't sprinters, so the Citadel Guard don't reach the Phantom Hosts. Grimbold does though, and that's why he's a hero. And the Hobgoblins decide they should be useful. They have no targets to shoot at, so they abandon their wall and start running for an objective. Grimbold and the Titan both make short work of those two undead units. I think the Titan could have handled it by himself. He did take one wound uh, in the process, but they both turn to face the big combat in the middle. They're ready for the next round. Speaking of the middle, here's a shot before any dice were rolled. And here's a shot of after combat. As predicted, the immortal battle standard bear did not survive. The Taruk on the side managed to kill one more winged reaper and suffered one loss in return. That's not bad. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, my general still is stuck in a challenge with the knight champion. He just can't seem to kill one freaking model. And here's one last quick overview of the board as we head into Vampire Covenants turn five. Which unsurprisingly starts with the Vampire Knights making an extremely easy charge into my Titan Mortar. And the Phantom Host making a flank charge into my Taruks. There's a picture of the Phantom Hosts making contact with the Taruks. And here's an overall of the board before we go into the magic phase. Now my opponent only has two spells. 
he's got raising undead and creating a new unit. I know one of those is going to go through, and the last thing I want is more winged reapers on the table. So unfortunately, I've got to let him create a new unit. And of course, he puts them directly in front of my hobgoblins. I think that's okay. My hobgoblins should be able to handle that, and the overrun might even carry me towards the objective. So then the second spell goes off because I roll a fistful of ones and twos, and we now have another winged reaper and a lot more zombies. Aye, aye. In the combat phase, the vampire knight somehow managed to do three wounds to my mortar and kill it dead. In the middle, the winged reapers really went to town on my Taruks, and there's only two left. They swung back pretty effectively, but the real problem was my general who after six or seven rounds of combat accidentally killed the champion in that night bus, which means he's next turn, he's going to be vulnerable to everyone else wanting to swing on him. And that's really bad. Which brings us to Infernal Dwarves, turn number five. Now, if this was a tournament game, Grimbold would not have declared this charge. He would have landed on that objective marker and laughed as he ran away with it. But I wanted to roll some dice, so Grimbold boldly declares a charge. And the Citadel Guard, they still want a piece of those Phantom Hosts, so they declare a charge. The Kadim Titan says, yes please, those uh, Bat Swarms are worth points, I will take those. And the Hobgoblins, they ain't afraid of no zombies, they charge too. The Citadel Guard, once again needing a 7, fail their charge. I gotta buy these guys some new Nikes or something. Here's Grimbold making his charge into the rear of the night bus and the Kadim rushing in to hug those bats to death. And the Hobgoblins making their one-inch charge. With no magic or shooting, we go straight to combat, and the Hobgoblins are not able to kill every one of those darn zombies. Well, I guess those zombies did their job. The Hobgoblins will not be able to make it onto that objective. The Kadim hugs some bats, and they disappear. And then this happened. My general being out of the challenge with the knight champion was now able to accept the challenge from the vampire general. Shemut was not pleased with his performance so far, it appears, because the vampire general hit him three times, wounded him three times. That left my overlord with a five up, five up. He promptly failed all armor and all ward saves. If he had even saved one, he would have survived, but nope, couldn't even do that. The Taruk, on the other hand, were finally able to kill the last of those freaking winged reapers. Thank God. Grimbold went to town on those knights a little bit, and he held, but now that they're no longer engaged in the front, they're free to turn and face him. And that's how it looks, going into the final Vampire Covenant turn six. It's their last chance for glory, so the Vampire Knights declare a charge on the flank of my Taruks. And they make it. In the magic phase, more zombies crawl out of the ground. I don't think my opponent wants my Kadim Titan slamming into that night bus very much. Speaking of combat, my Taruks are now all dead thanks to those vampire knights. And here's Grimbold who manages to get into a challenge with the vampire general. Not all that willingly, actually. The vampire inflicts two wounds on Grimbold. Grimbold does nothing in return, but he does hold and that's the important part. And off camera on the left, the hobgoblins managed to beat down the last of those zombies and get ready to run as fast as their little green legs will carry them towards an objective marker. Final turn for the infernal dwarves, the Kadim Titan charges a newly raised batch of zombies. And in their last chance for glory, the Citadel Guard once again charge a phantom host with one wound. Here's the Kadim Titan making his one inch charge. And the Citadel Guard finally make their charge. Here's the Hobgoblins. They got exactly one inch away from that objective marker. They can't pick it up, but they can look at it. The Citadel Guard managed to put one wound on the Phantom Host, and it will not haunt these ruins anymore. And the important combat in the middle. The Kadim Titan is easily able to wipe out the last of the zombies, while Grimbold continues his duel with the Vampire, Grimble takes one wound from the vampire. The vampire suffers no wounds in return, and Grimble holds. The sun sets, 
And here's a final parting shot of the game. When we added up the points at the end, it was exactly a 10-10 split, and neither of us got the objectives. I had an amazing time playing this game. My opponent was such a good guy, I would play him again anytime. And since those weapon caches are still out there, it looks like we're going to have to have a tiebreaker. Tales shall be told, songs shall be sung, and the Hall of Muttering Remembers. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions, comments, or if there was something you'd like to see in a future video, please leave a comment below. I try and respond to all feedback within 24 hours. I'm trying to do my part to help grow our community. If you liked what you saw, I would appreciate a like on my video. And if you really like what you saw, subscribe to my channel and you'll get a notification on your YouTube page when a future video is released. For more information about the Ninth Age and to download a free copy of the rules, please visit www.the-ninth-age.com. And for hobby advice, to learn more about why Infernal Dwarves are the coolest army in the game, or to hang around with some of the nicest folks on the internet, please visit my friends at www.chaos-dwarves.com. Peace out.